Not only do we get to be together, but we get to experience together both sacraments that Christ has given to the church. And so we'll sing together, we'll read God's Word together, we'll submit together to the preaching of God's Word, but we'll also participate together in both baptism and the Lord's Supper. And this, all these things are meant not only for our good and the glory of God, but they're meant to remind us about where we're going and the reunions that we'll have one day. And that some uh, that we know and love are already experiencing. So we are heading somewhere. And this morning's service of worship is meant to help us on that journey. So if you would turn to page three of your bulletin, we'll call one another into worship in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 3. And then we'll respond together with the Lord's Prayer on the top of page 4. But here for the call of worship, I'll read the light of print. Please respond together. Beloved, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. God said, with the light of shine in our darkness, and has shown in our hearts, to give the light knowledge to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We know that he who raised the Lord Jesus who raised us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. So we do not lose the heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This is like a momentary affliction. It is preparing for us the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. Things that are unseen are eternal. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ gives our life appears, then we also
Oh, 
There are also resources out in the foyer that you can study more about baptism, and any of the elders would be happy to discuss with you our view and understanding of baptism. But suffice it to say for now that this is a sign of God saying to these children, you are mine. Because Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, we're told that these promises are for us and for our children. And so as George and Mary stand before you, as Liz stands before you, professing their own faith, they're owning that faith for their children as well. Confident of God's promise, that the promise of a gracious redemption is for not only them, but for their children. So, I'm going to invite George and Mary and your kids up front, please. Liz, Zane, if you would join me up front. And I'm going to have some questions for moms and dad. And then we'll move to the back for the baptism. George and Mary joined with the elders uh, almost two months ago now. Liz was about a month ago when we, she met with the elders. But these two families are uh, old friends, and so we waited until they could stand together to come before you uh, and not only affirm these vows, but their children be baptized on the same day. So uh, George and Mary have been members already for a while, Liz for at least a month, I think, uh, but now they stand before you to affirm these vows. So Liz, Mary, George, I ask you these five questions again that you've already answered in the affirmative with the elders, but if you could... Uh, again, respond in the affirmative before your brothers and sisters here upon your seat. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope except in his sovereign mercy? Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered to you in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? Do you promise to support the church in her worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you? Lastly, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study her purity and peace? Do you? Well, welcome to Harvest. And now... Three questions, again, for George and Mary and Liz regarding your children. And then there's a question for you, members of Harvest, that I'll invite you to respond to in a moment as well. So then, first, do you acknowledge your children's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises in their behalf? Do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, even as you do for your own? Thirdly, do you now unreservedly dedicate your children to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before them a godly example? You will pray with them and for them. You will teach them the doctrines of our holy religion. You will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the faith. Now you harvest family. Do you, as a family, as a congregation, undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of these children? Do you? Amen. Now, a word to you three, Zane and Gloria and Caleb. Yes, everybody's looking at you. <laughs> yes, it's a little bit awkward. But we're going to sing something to you. Because we want you to know, above all else in this world, we want you to know that Jesus loves you. And that the world is going to look at you. You're going to look at yourself in the mirror. You're going to grow up and become whatever the Lord's going to cause you to be. And all along the way, you're going to be wondering, am I loved? But when you ask that question, or when the world asks that question of you, I want you to remember this day. The day when God said to you, I love you. 
So congregation, would you join me in singing to these children, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves you. Follow me. Let me show you that Jesus loves you.
There is salvation in none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you and thank you, God of peace. We thank you, Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and how you shepherd us. How you care for us, how you know us by name, how you protect us, how you sacrifice to purchase us, how you defend us and constantly intercede on our behalf before the Father. We praise you and thank you for that. We thank you for the unity and peace within the sheepfold that you've established. We thank you for the family here this morning, the family of God, the very body of Christ united together. We are so grateful how you love us through the body here and how we can watch the body loving one another. We praise you for that. That's a work of you in us. That's the work of your spirit moving through us. That you are doing what is pleasing in your sight through your people. We praise you for that. We thank you that you love us and include us. And the most wonderful things that you're doing. We thank you that you equip us with everything good that we may do your will. As we heard testified to in Sunday school this morning so beautifully, you have saved us, yes, and you have called us with a holy calling, and then you have set us loose, you have turned us loose in this world by the power of your spirit to work out that salvation with fear and trembling. That we not only represent the identity of who we are in Christ, but that we represent the infinite God of the universe rightly as you work through us. Thank you for including us in that. We thank you for the blood of the eternal covenant, the blood of Christ, by which the covenant promise is ratified, it's sealed, and it's delivered. We thank you as we see young men and a young lady this morning as they are included in the covenant. We thank you for the promises to families, to parents and to the household. Convict those young hearts now, even now, of the seal, the sign that they carry with them as those included in the covenant. Father, we pray for the lost around us, those that are outside of the covenant, those that know nothing of peace, let alone peace with you. Save them by your sovereign hand. Save them. And Holy Spirit, move in us, your people, to go and make disciples, to go. It's a call, it's a command. And it's a gift to be permitted to participate. We praise you. Father, we give you ourselves this morning. It's all we have. We give it to you for your glory as an act of worship. That your name would be great. That your salvation would be known to all the peoples. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Let's continue to worship in our <clears throat> offering.
those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his life. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent. And the Father who sent me is himself born witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you did not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, that you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? You do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? The grass withers, the flowers fade. The word of our God stands forever. Beloved, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you, God. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do ask that in these moments you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us minds to understand and hearts that are ready to receive and to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And that in believing we may have life. And that life demonstrate that life might be shown in our lives and the way that we conduct ourselves in our speech and our thoughts and our actions and the trajectories of our lives so Father be at work among us by your spirit for the sake of your glory Amen It's going to be helpful for us to bear in mind and remember that the Jews took their religion and spirituality very seriously. They were very serious about knowing God, as many of us are very serious about knowing God. They genuinely desired a relationship with God, and they worked very hard at keeping what they believed to be the rules that governed that relationship. Jesus, in fact, in verse 39, says that they were pursuing eternal life. It's easy to give the Jews a hard time, but they were doing what they thought was best. They were pursuing eternal life, but when eternal life walked among them, they did not receive it. In fact, they rejected eternal life. They persecuted eternal life. They hated it real thing, and they eventually murder eternal life. Because eternal life is a person, is a person. Jesus of Nazareth, God in human flesh. So we need to be not too quick to think ourselves better than the Jews of Jesus' day. What seems obvious to us may not have been so obvious at the time. Because surely the religious leaders were more concerned about morality and spirituality than many, maybe all of us are even taken together. The 
the truth of it is we may share more in common with them than we want to admit at first glance. So it will be helpful for us to consider what Jesus has to say to those who are persecuting him. Even though I'm sure none in this room would put themselves in the camp of those that persecute Christ, it may just be that we have things in common with those that did. In this little sermon in John 5, Jesus is exposing the unbelief of the Jews. It's going to help us in our own journey of belief to listen well to Jesus' words and to allow our own hearts to be exposed. The state of our hearts, as I'm sure you know, is always on display. Whether we see it in the moment or not, our hearts are always on display, and God always sees it. And here, Jesus is graciously exposing the heart to those that aren't able to see it. He removes the layers of the onion, as it were. And in doing so, he helps expose our hearts and the unbelief that might fester there. So that we might live. So that we might be safe. So that we might have life. So that we might cross from death to life and live as God wants us to live as God's designed us. The Jews were persecuting. They wanted to kill and eventually did kill Jesus because they did not believe that he had the right to do and say the things that he did and said. They were unbelieving. But what I would like for us to consider this morning is what is unbelief? And also, with Jesus' help, what does unbelief look like? What is unbelief, and what does it look like? It's going to help us submit ourselves to God's Word, and allow our own hearts to be exposed to the unbelieving bits of our lives. So first, what is unbelief? Simply put, unbelief is the refusal to receive Jesus as the Christ. Unbelief in this context is the refusal to receive Jesus as Christ. In another way, it's rejecting Jesus. Now again, I'm sure that most of us here would think ourselves not in that camp. We are not unbelieving. We don't refuse Jesus. We don't reject Jesus. We're here on a Sunday morning. We could be any number of other places doing maybe more enjoyable things. So obviously, preacher, we are not unbelieving. Yes, and in general, I think that's probably the case. That generally, we are believing. We just confessed that belief, didn't we? The Apostles' Creed a few moments ago. But, I know my own part, there are places where unbelief works. Places where I'm refusing to let the gospel of Jesus Christ shine in all its glory. Places where I am rejecting Jesus as the Christ in my own heart. Even as we saw last week in examining pride in our own hearts, it works. Unbelief works. And so it's helpful for it to be exposed so that we can call it what it is, name it, diagnose it, and repent of it, and move forward into fuller, richer, more glorious belief. In the first half of the passage, really verses 17 through 29, Jesus is claiming divine authority. And in doing so, he's allowing the Jews, putting on display for the Jews what it is they're rejecting. In being unbelieving, in, in rejecting Jesus, what they're saying is, you don't have the right to do and say the things that you're doing and saying. So for us, the way that we can behave unbelievingly, make an advert for us, the way that we can behave unbelievingly is to reject Jesus' authority in various places in our life. To behave as if Jesus doesn't have the right to claim divine authority. But we see in the first half of the passage Jesus making explicit claims to being not only authority, but being divine authority. In fact, being God himself. Any number of times, Jesus uh, demonstrates a union that he has with the Father. He is equal 
in relation to the Father. He's equal in action with the Father. As our confession speaks, God is one in substance, equal in power and in glory. Now, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit may play different roles, as it were, from where we stand, the way that we understand uh, the Trinity and the Godhead. Father, Son, and Spirit may have different roles, but they are the same in power and in authority. And Jesus makes that very clear. He speaks of honoring the Son and honoring the Father. And to dishonor the Son is to dishonor the Father. You say you honor the Father, but if you don't honor me as the Son of God, you aren't honoring the Father. So you may make great claims and boasts about your love for God, but if you reject Jesus, your love for God is void. It's not existing. Jesus speaks of, the, of him having the same power as the Father. Uh, for those that loved their Bibles in Jesus' day, that was the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it's very clear that only God has the power over life and death. God gives the breath of life. God takes life. It is God's prerogative to give or take life. And Jesus claims that same life. It is mine to give life, to raise from the dead. Jesus is claiming divinity. He says that he can raise from the dead. He can give life. And of course, here he's speaking of life in two different ways. He's speaking of physical life. And we know that he will go on to raise the dead in John chapter 11. And also Jesus himself will be raised from the dead. A further demonstration of his divine authority and power. For he's not speaking only about physical life. It is also Jesus, within his purview of authority, to give spiritual life. We see in John 5, 24, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him, he has eternal life. It is Jesus' prerogative to give spiritual life to those that are spiritually dead. In another incident in the Gospels, there is a, a lame man who is brought to Jesus by his friends. He can't get to Jesus, so his friends carry him. And what does Jesus say to the man? Your sins are forgiven. Which is an odd scene, because obviously this guy, I mean, to look at it, this guy is not interested in the forgiveness of sins. His legs don't work, he'd like to walk. And what Jesus says to him is, your sins are forgiven. I mean, that sparks a conversation, a debate, Jewish religious leaders who say, who can forgive sins but God alone? But again, Jesus is claiming divine authority. I have the right to forgive sin, Jesus says. And then he says, so that you can know that I have authority over sin. He says to the lame man, rise. And the lame man rises. The point being, similar to the Psalm early in the front of John 5, that Jesus has the power to command lame legs to start moving again. It's a demonstration of his authority to forgive sin as well. And if he has the authority to forgive sin, that's shown by his authority over the physical realm. Jesus, as God, grants life, physical and spiritual. And we even see that Jesus claims an authority to judge humans. It is his prerogative to execute divine judgment at the end of time. It is God's prerogative to give life, to take it away. It is God's prerogative to judge the works of humankind. And Jesus here claims that right as his own. The Father has given judgment to the Son. Jesus is making it as clear as he can that it is his divine prerogative to speak these words, to perform these miracles, and to claim the authority of being one with God. He claims himself as the source of life, both physical and spiritual life. In him is salvation. As the Father, verse 26, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Yeah. 
Jesus is the source of life. Verses 39 and 40, he, he demonstrates, Ramon, he lets the Jewish leaders know that what they're looking for is Jesus. You search the scriptures, thinking that in them you have eternal life. But they testify, they bear witness about me. He's saying, I'm the point. I am the source of life. I am the source of salvation. I am God. And unbelief says, no, you're not. <clears throat> unbelief either says explicitly, no, you're not, or implicitly by its behavior, no, you're not. No, Jesus, you don't have the right. You're a great teacher. Maybe there are things that we can learn from Jesus as a, as a great teacher. You know, some will tip the hat to Jesus as even maybe a miracle worker, but this whole claiming divinity thing is just too far. So we'll receive you, Jesus, as a teacher, as maybe a powerful miracle worker, but uh, we're not going to go so far as to bow. We're not going to worship you. See, you can be kind of pro-Jesus, like Jesus is a good dude, and not know Christ. There's a lot in our day that even religions, other than Christianity, that identify Jesus as someone worth emulating, someone whose teachings you can follow and learn from. But when it comes to bowing down to Jesus and worshiping Him as God, all those other religions and worldviews and philosophies fall short. Because it's just a bridge to far as unbelief. But the Christian, the follower of Christ, is one who hears the claims, sees the miracles, and submits. Because yes, I believe. Help my own belief. We see examples of belief uh, throughout John's gospel. Now, not only do we have examples of unbelief with the Jewish religious leaders, but we have a number of examples of belief where folks receive this message. They don't reject Jesus, they receive him. The disciples following Jesus, the Samaritan woman in chapter 4, owning her past and sharing Jesus with her village, that knew all her junk. The invalid earlier in chapter 5, obeying Jesus. That's belief. Jesus told a guy that had been lame for 38 years, get up and walk. And he actually did the work of trying to put energy to those muscles that hadn't worked in 38 years. He believed Jesus' words and walked. See, unbelief manifests itself in life, and so does belief. Belief is demonstrated in our lives. If unbelief is rejecting Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the long-expected Redeemer, as the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies and scriptures, if that is unbelief to reject Jesus as the Christ, belief is to receive Jesus and to entrust oneself to him. To say to Jesus, you are who you say you are, and I am who you say I am. To entrust yourself to the Messiah, banking on him being who he says he is. Hanging your whole eternity on Jesus. That's belief. To believe is to be spiritually alive, the unbelieving is to be spiritually dead. And throughout John's Gospel, not only do we have examples of unbelief and examples of belief, we also have invitations to believe, to enter into the promises of God, that we might know life, that we might come to have eternal life and participate in eternal life. Even in our passage, there's a number of allusions to, if you believe, you have life. 524, for example. But also later in John chapter 11, I mentioned Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead before the actual resurrection of the dead. Jesus is interacting with Mary. And in John 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says to Mary, do you believe this? 
It's an invitation to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. The whole book of John, as John chapter 20, verse 31 tells us, is an invitation to believe. All these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So there may be some of you here this morning that don't yet know that Jesus is the Christ. This Jesus of whom we speak, this carpenter's son from Nazareth, from the Hodunk village in Jerusalem from 2,000 years ago, he is God in the flesh, come to bear the sin of the human race so that you might have life. So that you might be united to God and freed from your sin and shame. So that you might have the hope of eternal life. And apart from Jesus, you remain dead in your transgressions and your sins and your trespasses. You might think you're living a good life. You might think you're being moral. You might think at least you're better than so and so. But if you're not bound in the King Jesus, you remain dead. You have no hope in you, no matter how good you appear in the outside. And for those of us that do know Christ and have submitted our lives to Christ, the question comes to us this morning, where is unbelief operating in my own heart? Where is unbelief operating? It can be helpful to understand, to get after that question, if you to define what unbelief is, rejecting Jesus as the Christ, it might be helpful if we knew what unbelief looked like. And Jesus helps us. In the latter half of our passage, verses 30 and following, primarily, Jesus tells us not only that unbelief is refusal to receive him, but he also tells us what unbelief looks like. We see, first of all, that it's a rejection of the witnesses. See, there are witnesses. The Old Testament tells us that except on the testimony of two or three witnesses, you don't, don't receive somebody's testimony just because one person says it. You've got to have at least two or three witnesses for a testimony to even be, begin to be credible. So Jesus comes and lists at least four, by my count, witnesses to his divinity in this passage. And one of the things that unbelief looks like is it looks like rejecting the witnesses, discrediting the witnesses that speak to Jesus' divinity. One, verses 33 to 35, is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a witness to Jesus. Even in the, the, we can characterize John the Baptist's ministry with one phrase, Behold the Lamb of God. John's ministry John the Baptist's ministry was one of preparation and of testimony. He bore witness to the deity of Jesus the Christ. That this Jesus, who was John's cousin, John is able to say, this one is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was a witness. But just one witness, anybody can make up a story. But not only does John the Baptist bear witness, but Jesus tells us that his works bear witness that he is God's son. Jesus' own works, his miracles. Uh, up to this point already in, uh, in, in John, in the narrative of John's gospel, we have multiple miracles demonstrated. Jesus changing water into wine. Jesus healing this uh, the, the invalid early in chapter 5. Jesus, in, later in, in chapter 4, the latter part of chapter 4, Jesus healing of a boy from a distance. The guy was 22 miles away, and Jesus heals him with the word. And the text tells us that there were other miracles that Jesus did in Jerusalem that bore witness to his divinity, to his authority. But the Jewish religious leaders were rejecting John the Baptist's testimony. They were rejecting Jesus' works as testimony. But even more sinisterly, they were rejecting God the Father's Testimony. In verse 32, when Jesus says, There's another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true, we might think that he's leading to John the Baptist, but he's actually talking about God the Father. Verses 33 and 35, there, or 36, are sort of a, uh, a, a parenthesis almost. 32, there is one who bears witness about me. 
for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, verse 36, the very works that I've done bear witness about me that the Father has sent me, in verse 37, and the Father who has sent me himself born, has borne witness about me. At Jesus' baptism, the Father speaks, This is my Son, whom I love. In him I am well Jesus' own works, John the Baptist's testimony, and the voice of the Father speaking, This is my Son. But furthermore, there's a fourth witness. And for the Jewish religious leaders, it may be the most damning. Because they loved the Bible. They loved the Old Testament. They knew the Old Testament. But they missed the entire point of the Old Testament. Verses 39 and following, Jesus says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. They had all 39 books of the Old Testament. I would imagine that many of these religious leaders had much of that material memorized. It was in their minds, it was in their hearts, but they missed the point. They couldn't see eternal life when it walked among them. They rejected Jesus. They were fundamentally unbelieving. They would not receive him as the Christ. Not because the witnesses don't bear witness, but because they didn't, it didn't, Jesus didn't fit their narrative. Jesus didn't fit their expectations. Jesus didn't fit their desires. But the scriptures testify that Jesus is the Christ. Verses 45 to 47, Jesus really sticks his finger in it. He says, y'all love Moses. And Moses condemns you because Moses was speaking about me. Explicitly, Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses tells the people of Israel that after me, God will raise up for you a prophet. To him you shall listen. They didn't listen to the prophet. They rejected Jesus. They missed the point. All the Messianic Psalms, the, the, the realities in the Old Testament that we see of a prophet, of a priest, of a king, all pointing to Jesus, and they rejected seeing him for what he was. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, I have come to fulfill them. Luke chapter 24, verses 27 and 44, Jesus opens up the Old Testament to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. He lets them see all the things in the Old Testament that were pointing to Jesus. Can you imagine that story? What a walk. Where Jesus speaks of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Of he's the fulfillment of Genesis 22, of Exodus 20, of Deuteronomy 18, of the whole sacrificial system, of all the evidences in the Psalms and the prophets of who the Messiah would be. The believer receives the witnesses. The believer submits to the overwhelming evidence that Jesus is the Christ. See, God doesn't expect belief to just come out of nothing. He gives us witnesses that we can investigate, that we can evaluate. Faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is a well-rounded assurance that what God says is true. The witnesses provide proof. And the witnesses that we have are irrefutable to those that have eyes to see. To reject the witnesses is to show yourself spiritually dead, blind to the truth, unwilling to see. What does unbelief look like? It looks like rejecting the witnesses. It also looks like pursuing man-centered glory. Unbelief looks like pursuing man-centered glory. So Jesus is talking about verses 41 to 45. 
I don't receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you, because you're unbelieving. I've come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you, when you receive glory from one another, and do not seek the glory that comes from the Lord God? We're too busy pursuing man-centered glory to believe in the glory of God made manifest among us. In order to believe, in order to have life, you have to let go of the glory of man. And many times the process of someone coming to faith in Jesus is God removing from them the, the, the lies that the glory of man is worth pursuing. What I mean by that, oftentimes God allows you to go through hardship he sometimes even allows you to get the very thing you want and to find out that you're still empty. You still don't have the life that you thought that thing would give you. See, the Bible calls that idolatry, right? Sometimes the Lord allows us to taste our idols, to get them, so that we can realize they're empty so that we can turn to Him. If we pursue man-centered glory, we might get it. But it will be all you ever get. So if you think that you'll be content with the praise of man, you won't. It doesn't do for you what you need done for you. Having a good reputation is great, but it won't give you new life. Having vocational success is, is good, but it won't resurrect your soul. Having financial security is wise and good, but it's not going to breathe life into you. Being a moral person is good. We should all be moral people. Your morality can't save you. Having some measure of spiritual prowess won't do your soul any real good, not apart from Christ. We have to give up pursuing what man pursues. In a way for us to understand what that might look like in our own lives is we can ask a question like, what is shaping my life? What's directing my life? How do I make decisions? What's the metric that I run through when I'm making a big decision in life? Many of you have big decisions to make. Oftentimes decisions are made for you. But even in those decisions that are made for you, you have to figure things out. How do you evaluate what things you'll pursue in your life? If you're willing to take a look at that, and the metric that you use to determine do I go right, do I go left, or do I stay straight on, it can help you understand are you believing this good news about Jesus functionally in your life? Is Jesus a part of the decision making metric? What is shaping your life? What's directing your life? Look, we better get this right. What glory are you pursuing? If we get this question wrong, we are hopeless apart from Christ's intervention. What glory are we pursuing? We need to be clear about it. We need to allow ourselves to be opened up to the Lord and His Word. Father, show me what glory am I pursuing? Because the Jews thought they were pursuing the glory of God. And they were wrong. Instead of pursuing the glory of God, they murdered the glory of God. And lest we think that we're too different, too much different from them, we need to allow ourselves to be exposed to the word of God to see whether or not we might be pursuing man-centered glory instead of God's glory. Many of you know I'm not much 
also a social media guy. I have a friend on Facebook, and I, I may be on Facebook just for this friend's posts. He often is very insightful in the culture and the Christian heart and into uh, humor as well, which is helpful. Recently, he posted these words. Reminder, the media, conservative, progressive, wants you to be afraid, ticked off, resentful, and to react with outrage. That's how they make money. You want to change the world? Seek contentment in Jesus. Seek the patient ferment of the kingdom of Christ. Otherwise, you're just going to move from whatever outrage du jour is being served up for you to gorge on like a fat man rolling around. Many of us are fat men at Golden Corral. We're feeding on outrage. We're pursuing the glory of outrage. And it's destroying us. Beloved, what glory are you pursuing? The glory of outrage or the glory of a risen Savior? Where does unbelief show itself in your heart? Pursuing success or reputation or power in any form. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Jesus comes offering the way to life, and that way looks like submission to Jesus, to receiving Him and His authority in all areas of our lives. Beloved, if our lives are shaped by the pursuit of anything other than God's glory, it will lead to death. But the glory of God is life and peace, both now and for eternity. So may God give us grace to evaluate the claims of Jesus, to take a serious, hard look at who Jesus says he is, and what the witnesses demonstrate him to be. And may God give us grace to let go any pursuit of a man centered glory in every and any area of our lives so that our lives might be characterized by life, not by the stench of death. The invitation to believe in Jesus is ever present. So let us receive it and let us live. Let's pray. Father, Jesus is your Son. He is our Savior. He is God incarnate. So by your Spirit, would you give us eyes to see and eyes that recognize, ears that hear the witnesses, minds that are willing to do the hard work of investigation and evaluation and even measuring up our own lives to see where we might be out of alignment or out of accord where we might be rejecting the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Father, make us more open to the glory of Jesus. Make us more submissive, more humble, more grateful. Make us more alive. That we might demonstrate not primarily our belief, but that we might demonstrate Jesus to a world that is dead and dying and dark and hopeless. So that you may get the glory of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. By way of response to the text, let's turn to page 80 of our bulletins and we'll sing the hymn, Help My Unbelief. Page 8 of your bulletins, we'll sing, Help My Unbelief.
just ask the question, how is it possible? How can we do the things that God calls us to do when we recognize the, the, the sin and the brokenness in our own hearts, the reality of our own ongoing unbelief? How is it possible? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How is it possible, beloved, in you? It's not. God has done what you and I cannot by sending Jesus to condemn sin so that the law might be fulfilled in us. Can you imagine? In you, the law fulfilled. Not because of your good behavior, but because of Jesus, the merit of Jesus' life given to you by the Father. That is good news. So that all that God expects and requires of you has been done perfectly. The deal is done. The documents are signed. You are His. And when the judgment comes, the Father will look at you. So in Christ, and your eternity is one glory to Him. If you know that to be the case, if you have submitted your life to Jesus, Jesus invites you to this table because here we remember his body and his blood. We remember what it took for us to be united to God. We remember what it takes for the law to be fulfilled in us. It takes the righteousness of Jesus. And if you know that righteousness is your own, come, taste and see what the Lord's doing. But if you don't know Christ, if you haven't bowed the knee to King Jesus, now is not the time for you to eat this little bit of bread and drink some wine. Now is the time for you to examine the claims of Christ and evaluate your own life. How's it going pursuing pursue in your own glory? How's that working out for you, friend? The outcome isn't great, but in Jesus, the outcome is glory. Now and forevermore. Let's pray together. Father, we have here what you've given to us, a reminder of Jesus' body and blood. And to natural eyes, that's all it is. But to spiritual eyes, those that you've given spiritual sight to, those that have life in them by your Spirit, here we have the body and blood of our Savior, broken for us, shed for us, sufficient for us. So help us to feed on Jesus by faith. And those with us this morning that don't know Christ as Savior, Father, would you convict them of their sin and their waywardness? But more so, Show them the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Overwhelm them with the beauty of a Savior who bled and died on their behalf and who was raised for their sake. So, Father, work faith into us through the celebration of this meal by the power of the glorious Spirit. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread and broke it. He said, This is my body broken for you. The same way after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus also added that he wouldn't eat this bread and drink this cup again until the new heavens and the new earth, when he eats and drinks it with us. The day is coming. So if you're Christ, and you're prepared, please come forward, receive the elements of bread and wine. And be fed by Jesus, your Savior. I would note for you that the outer ring is wine in the individual cups. The inner ring is the grape juice. The common cup has wine in it. If you'd like to take from the common cup, no doubt.
There are some individual community supplies in these two tables back in the corner. If you'd rather not come forward, there's a platter here with gluten free wafers as well. So I think with all the instructions out of the way, if the elders would come and assist when you're prepared to come and receive the body and blood of Jesus, please do so. So yeah, taste and see the Lord's good. God's people said together. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and we who have faith in him can sing like we need it.
one more reminder, receive God's good word and his benediction to you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Today and forevermore, Jesus our King and our Savior. God's peace. Amen.